the future is a concept. It doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, the podcast about the stuff we wonder about. And other things. We are here with Steven Snyder, a.k.a. Recluse, a parapolitical researcher and investigator. Today we are here to talk about his new book, Strange Tales of the Parapolitical. So how are you doing today? Doing great, Scott, and thanks for having me back on. How you holding up during this crazy COVID-19 chaos? Uh, I mean, it's, you know, pretty well. Um, you know, I mean, I live out here in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia. So, um, you know, I haven't really had any concerns about uh, the general chaos that's been going on in the uh, more urban areas and so on. And um, I mean, to be a perfect honest, it's actually been a bit of a blessing for me with the whole thing with the book coming out and just, you know, being able to do all these podcasts to uh, promote it and a lot of other stuff I've been working on. Um, Geez, I even like filed a grant proposal with the National Endowments of Humanities. So, um, unlike a lot of people, I figured out a lot of ways to stay busy through all of this. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, that sounds like a lot of good stuff. Also, by the way, I wanted to compliment you on your um, channel that I just recently became aware of. The uh, is it Zero Night, I believe, on YouTube. You guys are doing some awesome stuff on there. I think you, Christopher Knowles, and um, is it uh, Frank Zero? Is yeah, right? Frank Zero. Yeah, my co-author, too, of Strange Tales. I love what you guys are doing on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. I guess I wanted to start. I, th I know there's a couple things we've covered, so there might be some overlap, but whatever. No big deal. Um, let's, if you want to start with the Mellon family of Pittsburgh and kind of how that family historically ties into different behavioral modification programs. Sure. Um, well, you know, the Mellons, of course, um, you know, they were from outside the kind of northeastern uh, section of the United States that historically produced a lot of the financial elites. Um, you know, the patriarch was Judge Thomas Mellon, uh, but the guy who really put them on the map was Andrew Mellon, the long tenured secretary of the Treasury. He held the post from 1920, I think, to about 1932. So this is throughout the whole roaring 20s and then going up to the stock market crash of 1929. Of course, there's been a lot of debate over the years as to how much responsibility he deserves for both events. Um, <laughs> but um, certainly he was uh, quite a foil of FDR during the 1930s and so forth at the height of the Great Depression. Um, and the Mellon family, of course, was there, just, you know, the absolute founding of the U.S. intelligence community. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Mellon's son, Paul Mellon, had been in the OSS, and quite a few other family members and in-laws had been. Uh, of course, there was David Bruce, another Mellon in-law, who uh, had really been Donovan's number two in the OSS at several points, and uh, had also overseen the crucial operations in London. Um, another one that I'm sure we'll get to was Alan Scafe, the uh, husband of Sarah Mellon. Uh, you know, they certainly produced one of the uh, more interesting um, Mellon scions in recent years. But, um, you know, I think in the grand scheme of things, there were at least half a dozen, if not more, Mellon family members or in-laws that had been involved in the OSS. And they would continue the uh, relationship with the intelligence community for years afterwards. Um, and in Strange Tales, I really focused on two of the Mellon heirs specifically as kind of a case study. The first one was uh, William Mellon Hitchcock, uh, who just played an enormous role in establishing the counterculture and specifically um, LSD. Of course, he had uh, been a patron of Timothy Leary uh, initially after Leary had been booted out of Harvard. And uh, he ended up setting Leary up at his estate in, upsta his, uh, estate in upstate New York, Millbrook, which uh, Leary had kind of turned into a counterculture mecca for a number of years. And then towards the late 60s, um, you know, William Mellon uh, had ended up becoming the major financier for the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, which at the time was the largest LSD smuggling ring in the entire world. So, I mean, it wasn't just a matter of him popularizing LSD, but it was also in spreading it across the United States. And this was, of course, you know, after sort of the heyday of the LSD experiments with uh, MK Ultra and Project Artichoke. But um, a more direct link you know, with these behavior modification programs came in the form of William uh, Mellon Scafey, the one I just mentioned before, um, the son of Alan Scafey and Sarah Mellon Scafey. Uh, this guy had kind of gotten involved in it uh, through his association with a guy named Frank Barnett. 
And Barnett, uh, you know, he was a Rhodes Scholar the whole nine yards. Uh, during the 1950s, he had become involved in these uh, these indoctrination programs at the National War College. And uh, one of the guys he was working with here was a fellow named Colonel James Monroe, who was one of the big figures in the um, Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology. And this was, of course, the front uh, that it was being funded by the Rockefeller family that was being used to sponsor a lot of the MK Ultra research. And um, Monroe was involved in some way in what uh, Barnett was doing with these National War Colleges. And these things were essentially designed to indoctrinate military officers um, in anti-communism. And then, of course, uh, in the early 60s, Barnett ended up founding the National Strategic Information Center, which was geared towards the same thing, but indoctrination of labor unions uh, and a lot of the top officials in that and what have you. And this is, you know, it's really interesting to me because um, this is an aspect of MKUltra that's really never been discussed very much, was how uh, it was potentially used for psychological warfare. Of course, you know, we usually think of like psychic driving and, you know, the personalized use of it. But uh, Barnett seems to have been tied into somehow and in how these methods were being applied to psychological warfare. And one of the big financiers behind the NSIC was Richard Melanscafe. And um, Burnett would later span on to a lot of other organizations, of course, uh, in the United States. The big one was the American Security Council, which was just pivotal in establishing a lot of um, – the alternative subcultures, especially amongst conspiracy theorists and so forth in the United States. Um, you know, I mean, almost all of like the anti-UN, uh, the anti, uh, you know, New World Order, a lot of the anti-Federal Reserve stuff almost all originates with the ASC, as does a lot of the anti-Rockefeller, uh, you know, stuff, which is funny because the Rockefellers were actually um, big sponsors as well of uh, the American Security Council, ironically. But on the flip side of the coin, a lot of, um, you know, UFOology had ties to the ASC as well through Nightcap, through a lot of the Hangar 18 mythos, uh, some of the Area 51 mythos, a lot of the big figures in the ASC were tied into the UFO field. So, um, you know, they did a lot to shape these alternative alternative subcultures that have become so popular in the 21st century. And uh, it is interesting with the presence of a guy like Barnett, who's, you know, involved in some kind of capacity with MK Ultra. And then later, you know, this kind of stuff would go on to the UK through the Institute for the Study of Conflict, which was headed by Brian Crozer. And again, Richard Melanscafe was the guy funding these operations as well. And uh, interestingly, another financier behind the ISC was uh, Rupert Murdoch, who, of course, would go on to uh, become the chairman of Fox News, uh, certainly has its own you know, reputation as a propaganda outfit and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's just really fascinating when you look at this lineage. Yeah. Can you touch on Hitchcock and his relation to the, the entity known as Resorts International and just kind of give a brief uh, intro into what Resorts International was? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, well, Resorts International had originally begun as a company called the Mary Carter Payne Company, and um, there are a lot of allegations that it was uh, a CIA front. Of course, one of the early stockholders and it was Thomas Dewey, who had been the um, Republican candidate for the presidency in, I believe, both 44 and 48. Uh, Dewey was really, really close to the Dulles brothers. Um, Alan Dulles had worked very closely in his campaigns, I think especially the 48 one. Um, but anyway, it was also set up out of Tampa, which was, uh, you know, where Mafia Don Santos Traficante was based out of. Um, he was the guy who really kind of organized the Cuban Mafia, where there was a lot of overlap with the anti-Castro Cubans and what have you. So it's certainly very compelling that Mary Carter might have been tied up in all of this, you know, the attempts to overthrow Castro in the early 60s. But um it became resorts in the mid 1960s, and this was after it bought into um, Paradise Island uh, in the Bahamas, and there it set up uh, a bunch of casinos, and uh, it also at this point seemed to become very closely tied to organized crime. Of course, um, associates of Mir Lansky were essentially the ones that resorts had hired to oversee the casinos and that type of thing. So very much a mobbed up entity. But on top of that, uh, it also seems to continued having ties with the U.S. intelligence community to the point that it even set up its own private intelligence outfit called Intertel at one point uh, in 1970. And Intertel became a major 
major private security company and still operated up to the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere uh, thereabouts. Uh, and it had a lot of, you know, veterans of the NSA, of the Treasury Department, the FBI, even a couple of CIA hands as well. So, I mean, it was a very upscale uh, outfit and one of the really the first and the, uh, you know, really corporatized private security industry, uh, firms that have become so prevalent uh, since the 90s. So a trailblazer in that sense as well. But I mean, resorts, you know, I mean, it's all mobbed up. It's got these ties to the U.S. Uh, intelligence community. And then on top of everything else, one of the largest shareholders was uh, Richard Mellon Hitchcock. So, um, there were, excuse me, William Mellon Hitchcock. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you've got the acid financier. And then on top of that, uh, Richard Nixon was also involved with it back in this point in time as well. So uh, you've got a Republican presidential candidate, um, an acid financier, and a bunch of associates of Miralinsky. Um, I suppose it's almost like a joke about the three guys that go into a bar or something like that. <laughs> Did Intertel ever end up evolving into anything else, or does it still exist, or has it kind of dissipated, or whatever happened with that? I don't know. I've been very interested. I mean, it essentially ceased existing around the time that the longtime head, Robert Pelliquin, died. Um, I think he had sold out maybe around late 80s, early 90s. And I think from there it was maybe divvied up or bought up by another firm. But yes, I would really love to know what exactly had happened to Intertel as well. And so what's the connection between Hitchcock and Castle Bank and Trust? Um, Castle was funded by, was it Paul Hel Hellowell? Yeah, Paul Hellowell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was that? What was the relationship with Hitchcock in that? Well, um, Castle Bank and Trust was essentially who Hitchcock had hired, if I remember correctly, to manage um, parts of his vast fortune or something to that effect. They were the ones who had uh, been managing specifically his shares in resorts. And I think at some point he had even sued them essentially over how they had been conducting their business in that regard. That was sort of what it uh, led to his whole downfall with Operation Trade Winds, which was a, an IRS investigation into you know money laundering and that. That type of thing in the early 70s um but yeah like you said castle bank and trust have been used by the cia for many many years to finance their you know off the book uh, operations all across the world and with that how so halliwell basically it established um in your book it's civil air transport which later became air america and and sea supply inc and these yes. were basically they were basically CIA front companies as well for drug trafficking. Is that correct? Yes, essentially. Well, of course, Air America. I mean, there's not really much secrets about that. Uh, they even made what the the um, the Mel Gibson movie about it, and uh, what the late '80s or something, ironically, with uh, what Robert Downey Jr. Uh, co-starring in it. Uh, but um, yeah, no. I mean, it was really throughout the Vietnam era, and then of course going back to the '50s, it had been partially owned by um, the apartheid government of Taiwan, um, the Nationalist Chinese, which really that whole regime was you know, financed almost entirely by drug money in the early years. Um, and then, of course, it went on to the, you know, later incarnations in Air America and Vietnam. And um, I think some vestige of it even continued up until the Iran-Contra era, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. And this is kind of off topic, but in kind of related, I'm, cur I'm curious, do you have any insight into the airliner that was used with the Clinton um, in Mena, Arkansas situation? Oh, you mean the one with uh, Barry Seal? Yeah. Was um, that a separate airline? Or? I Yeah, I think it was something that he had set up separately, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not super familiar with Barry Seal's whole case, but I mean... Yeah, I mean, obviously, the civil air transport, that wasn't the only airline that the CIA had used over the years. Right. And in relation to the CIA's involvement with, like, MK Ultra and Artichoke... Um, there was this group called Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology, which, if I understand correctly, was used by the CIA to fund all these behavioral modification research projects. Is that correct? It was used to fund some of them, specifically the MK Ultra projects, but there were some other ones too, like what the Greshner Fund or something like that. But um, yeah, they did have a couple of different ones, and from what I recall, the Artichoke financing was a little more enigmatic. Of course, that was you know unlike uh, MK Ultra, which was pretty much strictly a CIA program, Artichoke was very much a joint uh, CIA Pentagon project as well. So I mean, the military was probably providing a decent amount of funding in some capacity as well 
can you talk a little bit about the National Strategy Information Center and who Frank Barnett was and kind of like the role he plays in the psychological warfare operations? I know you touched on it a little bit, but... Yeah, well, I mean, he was a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he had gotten tied up with the American Security Council, um, which was a very broad organization. The NSIC was kind of a more exclusive elite organization that oversaw it, of course. Um, you know, there was a member of the Bush family in the NSIC. There was, I think, Frank Shakespeare, who went on to have a big role in the Heritage Foundation. And, of course, there was um, William Casey, who eventually became uh, CIA director under Ronald Reagan and was, of course, a major figure in the whole Iran-Contra thing and what have you, and himself an OSS veteran. Um, so, you know, this was very exclusive, very powerful company. Um, Barnett, like I said before, I mean, he had been involved in these kind of psychological warfare projects with um, the people from the Society of Human Ecology in the 1950s, and it seems like it spread into the American Security Council and potentially into, you know, these different conspiracy culture type things. And, um, you know, I mean, Barnett obviously wasn't the only tie that the ASC had to these behavior modification programs. I mean, a lot of the artichoke guys also had personal relationships with some of the ASC people. I mean, one obvious one would be Lee Pennington, who was the uh, director of security or something to that effect for the American Security Council. He was a longtime FBI agent who had gone to work with the CIA in the 1950s, and his handler was uh, General Paul Gaynor, who was also the guy who oversaw Artichoke in the Office of Security. So, you know, you had a lot of those types of connections. Um, and then even later, the American Security Council featured uh, none other than uh, Colonel Michael Aquino in its ranks, of course, the infamous founder of the, uh, the Temple of Set and uh, all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So, you know, it really seems like there was a lot of... Uh, interesting things in terms of just psychological warfare derived from Artichoke and MK Ultra that was going on in the ASC for many years. Wow, and yeah, you mentioned how the ASC links to the world of UFOlogy and like Area 51 and the Strategic Defense Initiative as well. That's, that's fascinating. What, what exactly was the Strategic Defense Initiative again? Uh, well, it was, you know, it was nicknamed Star Wars. Uh, the sort of architect of it was a guy named Stefan Pisoni, uh, major technocrat. Um, but essentially, Pisoni had advocated um, in the early 70s that the United States should embark upon weapons research that would be so expensive that there was just no way that the Soviet Union could keep pace with it. And um, Effectively, this would be a means of, uh, you know, bankrupting the <laughs> the evil empire, so to speak. And that really materialized with um, the SDI. You know, I mean, it was just the whole attempt to weaponize space. There's been a lot of dispute for years as to how much legitimacy the research that was done under it had. I mean, some people have argued that this is where, you know, we got the technology for HARP and that type of thing from. Others, of course, argued that uh, it wasn't really spent on much much of anything other than gold-plated toilet seats and that type of thing at the Pentagon. Um, probably like a lot of things, the truth was somewhere in between, but if nothing else, it was enormously expensive. Uh, it greatly uh, increased the pocketbooks of the defense contractors who were the principal sponsors of the American Security Council, and it did its intended purpose of absolutely bleeding the Soviet Union economically. So, um, for a lot of parties, it was probably a resounding success. Um, obviously, though, not so much for the American public. <laughs> well, let's move on to the Nazi underground and the Special Operations Mafia. I think this is referred to as Odessa or the Black Order. Can you talk a little bit about this group and some of the black operations that were carried out by them? Well, this was sort of a loose network of you know former SS men and what have you um, in the aftermath of the Second World War, kind of the you know, public figurehead of all this was Otto Scrizzini, who, you know, used a lot of these guys over the years for various mercenary activities and what have you. Of course, the whole situation with Nazar in Egypt in the 1950s is a great example of that. He, you know, procured several military veterans, German officers and what have you for Nazar to help build up his security forces along with some scientists and that type of thing. And um, later, Scorzini would go on to found um, one of the earliest um, 
private military companies, modern private military companies, the Paladon Group, which would also make heavy use of a lot of these guys. And, um, you know, they were used by a host of different regimes. There's even some indications that they might have been used for black operations in Vietnam, for instance. Um, so, yeah, um, kind of ironically, um, Scorsini was also allegedly one of the um, basis for the uh, the B James Bond villain, what's his name, uh, Blofeld or something like that, the guy who headed Spectra, uh, oh, okay. which was essentially kind of a stand-in for Odessa. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting situation. Uh, let's talk about the BDN, or I'm going to try to pronounce it, uh, the Bundesnaturidentist. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that, but basically the Federal Intelligence Service um, located in Berlin. I believe it's currently the world's largest intelligence headquarters. Um, it was the successor to an earlier Galen organization known as simply the Org. Um, so what was, or who was Galen and, and what was his relation to Hitler exactly? Well, he had been the chief um, military intelligence officer for the Eastern Front during the war. Um, you know, one thing that probably should be pointed out, Galen was not like a fanatical Nazi like he sometimes depicted. I mean, he was certainly quite, you know, right wing. But, um, yeah, uh, the Galen org was sort of, you know, the more I've looked at that, it was sort of like the, you know, continuation of a lot of the German military officers, intelligence officers and so forth. And uh, it was then kind of shadowed by this SS underground that um, Scrozzini oversaw. So you sort of had the main line German military intelligence officers who occupied more of the senior posts and the Gellin Org or later the BND. And then you had kind of the more shadowy, openly Nazi types who were at least attempted to keep in the background, so to speak. Let's kind of touch on Operation Condor. Um, wh what exactly was Operation Condor? Well, that was a program that was established uh, in the southern cone of South America during the 1970s. Um, several intelligence services there put it together, um, the DINA in Chile, uh, the Argentinian security services, some of the ones in Paraguay, um, a couple of other ones. But... Um, you know, at this point in time, there were a lot of Marxist groups, um, rebel groups, going against many of the what were essentially military dictatorships in that whole region of the world. And a lot of the rebel groups persisted by fleeing across the border. Say, you know, if you're in Argentina, you go into Chile, and then the Argentinian security forces can't track you down. And Condor, at least initially, was supposed to take care of that problem. Now, either the Argentinians could cross the border and kill the rebel forces there, or more likely, they would just simply ask the DINA or some other equivalent Chilean forces to go and apprehend them for them and disappear them or something to that effect. Um, but, of course, it eventually became quite ambitious um, to the point that they'd started carrying out operations beyond South America and going into Europe and the United States, which is, uh, at least when the, uh, it ran somewhat afoul of the U.S. intelligence community, it was, of course, you know, fine to kill your political enemies in your own particular region of the world, but not so much when you try blowing them up on uh, Embassy Row in Washington, D.C. Right. Um, now, let's go into the circle uh, in relation, well, actually, I mean, first could maybe we could touch on Operation Gladio and Bloodstone and kind of give people a sense of what those are, and then List Circle, and who exactly we're talking to when we're referring to List Circle. Sure. Um, well, Bloodstone was essentially an operation to uh, destabilize the Soviet Union in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War and the early years of the Cold War. And basically, they recruited a lot of expat Europeans and tried to send them uh, undercover into the Soviet Union, uh, specifically a lot of the Eastern European countries, uh, really a lot of the the major focus of the operations initially were Albania and that type of area of the world. But um, essentially, they would go in there, they would uh, set up rebel groups that would, you know, carry out assassinations and blow up munitions factories and damage railroad tracks and that type of thing and gradually destabilize the, United, uh, the Soviet Union you know, in theory, in conjunction with help from Army Special Forces or something to that effect. Um, of course, a lot of this stuff ended up being an utter disaster. I mean, practically 
you know, I mean, uh, all these uh, immigrant networks were thoroughly penetrated by Soviet intelligence. And of course, you had Kim Philby for the UK, who was overseeing a lot of this, uh, who was also an infamous Soviet double agent. So pretty much everyone that we sent in there was either killed or was already themselves a Soviet agent or something to that effect. Um, but it was somewhat similar to the premise of Gladio as well. Um, Gladio was based on Operation Jedberg, which had been a joint OSS uh, special operations executive operation during World War II. And essentially, you know, you dispatch these commandos uh, behind enemy lines. They you know, met up with rebel groups and they did much the same thing that Bloodstone was designed to do. They were supposed to assassinate leaders. They were supposed to blow up munitions factories and just carry out general sabotage operations and, you know, run what would now be thought of as a guerrilla war against uh, the occupying power, which at the time was Nazi Germany. And, um, you know, it was felt with the rise of the Soviet Union that this would make a lot of sense to do across Western Europe in case the Soviets decided to go through with an invasion. Uh, you know, these guys would work with Army Special Forces, they would rage a guerrilla war against the Soviet troops and, you know, gradually wear them down or something to that effect. Though, that is not uh, in practicality what actually happened. Um, in point of fact, you know, they were often used by uh, the U.S. and probably the U.K. to carry out actions of terrorism, to be engaged in arms and drug trafficking, probably sex trafficking, and a host of other activities that were used to destabilize many of the Western European allies and ensure that they remain subservient to the United States. And that's kind of where Le Cercal plays into all of this. I mean, that was a private organization that kind of began as an offshoot of the Bilderberg Group. Um, several of the founding members, well, actually pretty much all the founding members were figures in the Knights of Malta or Opus Dei. It was quite reactionary uh, Catholic organization in the early years. And also, almost all of the founders were deeply involved in these, you know, these stay-behind operations. Gladio was mainly the the Italian component. This, all the other stay-behind operations had their own unique names. Um, <clears throat> Greece, I think it was known as Sheepskin, for instance. Um, Turkey, it was Counter Guerrilla or something to that effect. But almost all of the Cercal members, like Giulio Andradia and Italy and... Um, Franz Joseph Strauss in Germany and a lot of these other guys uh, had almost all had extensive ties to the stay behind networks in their respective countries. So it really seems like in the early years, the Sir Cal was almost uh, intended to be a managing body for these stay behind operations. And that's where I think the presence of these, you know, these Catholic orders like Opus Dei and the Knights of Malta were very significant as well, because frequently they were also used as major coordinating bodies for these stay behind networks. So there was quite a degree of overlap in that capacity. Uh, we, I think I believe we might have touched before also on the connection between the them and the the P1 lodges, the P1 and P2. Um, in our previous conversations, was, but that, that's an interesting little side conversation as well. But um, one of the things I wanted to get to, you cover a lot of the private military contractors in, in the book, and one of the ones that's of interest to me is DynCorp International. Could you go into a little bit about DynCorp that was all about? Yeah, DynCorp, I mean, it's been around um, in some form or other since the 19. 50s or something to that effect and it's um you know obviously when we think of dying core we usually assume of it being you know engaged in blackwater type activities with you know special operations veterans and that type of thing um which certainly is something that's a very big part of what they do but um i was really amazed just to see the sheer scope of the stuff that it was engaged in i mean you know they've done everything from you know cut lawns of federal buildings in washington dc to developing vaccines and just all kinds of other crazy stuff um they're also deeply involved in a lot of it intelligence work and what have you as well so i mean yeah it's really a conglomerate of uh, various defense related projects in a very you know in a real sense uh it's certainly very fascinating yeah Did, was there any connection that you made between them and um ICE, the immigration? Have you ever um, 
Yeah, I I think they did later take on some of the contracts with ICE, if I'm not mistaken, which would make sense. I mean, they have been used, um, in theory, to train a lot of the police forces and that type of thing. And, um, you know, the Balkans uh, during the whole Kosovo thing in the 90s. Um, Of course, that was also one of the more infamous episodes in the history of the company as several of the uh, Dime Corps members have been implicated in the trafficking of minors for sex rings and that type of thing. Um, yeah, it was really quite a horrendous scandal that broke out there. But certainly, I mean, that's one of their specialties, allegedly, is they train security forces and specifically police and that type of thing. So, I mean, the fact that they might have gotten contracts to train ICE is definitely a distinct possibility. Definitely. And then we got Blackwater, which is probably a more well-known and controversial one, um, which with, has to do with Eric Prince. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, of course, Prince came from, you know, kind of a grandee conservative family. And um, his sister, of course, uh, married into the DeVosi family, the, uh, what was it, Amway fortune that they've got behind them or something to that effect. Um, and, of course, the Prince family has also been a major player in uh, the Council for National Policies for many years, which is a very exclusive right-wing network it was kind of set up originally as the um the american rights answer to the council on foreign relations or something to that effect uh the prince families had a lot of involvement in that for years um so it was kind of against this backdrop when eric joined the navy seals in the late 90s um his father died at a fairly young age and he inherited a good chunk of the family fortune and that's what it um spurred him to start up blackwater in the late 90s um of course you know as we all know it really came into its own uh after the war on terror became in er- began in earnest in 9-11 and um prince from very early on and i'm guessing probably because of his family's ties the cnp was entrusted with some really black projects um specifically it seems like the cia effectively turned over a full scale death squad to him um <laughs> that um I'm trying to remember the guy who the big figure in it, it was like Enrique something, but this guy had started out essentially as a hitman for um, the Cuban mafia, like in the 70s, the 1980s in Miami. And then uh, during the whole Iran Contra era, he had gotten tied up with the CIA and they had eventually brought him on as a paramilitary specialist or something. And this was one of the main guys that um, Prince was leaning on effectively for this death squad. Um Of course, there's been a lot of rumors for years if he still has control of it, that it was reactivated after Trump assumed the presidency. Um, A lot of crazy stuff. Um, So, yeah, I mean, Blackwater, I mean, it did a lot of covert operations for the CIA during uh, the Bush years um, until, obviously, the controversy with the shootings and then probably some degree of political retaliation uh, when Obama became the president, uh, effectively forced Prince out. But, um, you know, certainly it seems like he's uh, not hurting too much for money and has uh, set up some other interesting things with his Frontier Services Limited recently. Well, it's actually, yeah, it's it's based out of Hong Kong, actually, and ironically, they do a lot of um, work for China. In fact, it's uh, been a lot of rumors that they were one of the, you know, groups that set up the, you know, what have been referred to as the concentration camps for Chinese Muslims, so... Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Wow, that's fascinating. I remember, I actually just recently kind of was hearing a little bit about that. The Aegis uh, PMC is an interesting one. What What's the connections between that and um, the Arms to Africa scandal? You know, Spicer moved to Sierra Leone where he became... Yes, uh, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they had been hired for some, I think, to contribute guns or something like that to Sierra Leone. This was kind of after executive outcome had moved out um, around 97 or something, and this was kind of one of the... Success. Well, actually, I think it was... I don't think Aegis was actually the one that was involved in that. If I remember correctly, it was Sandline, um, which was kind of the predecessor to Aegis, uh, Sandline International. Um, but yes, it had proved a bit of an embarrassment for Tony Blair's uh, government, to put it mildly. Uh, but then again, I mean, the UK, you know, these illegal arms deals have just been such a huge part of their economy since the Thatcher era. Um, but yeah, occasionally uh, some of it does leak out, and that was kind of what happened there in the 90s with the the big three um which are you know blackwater dyncorp and uh triple canopy 
canopy yet. Well, that was another PMC, um, you know, much like um, Blackwater. Uh, Blackwater, of course, like I said before, Eric Prince had been um, a Navy SEAL, so it was um, it was organized more along the lines of the SEALs, whereas Triple Canopy had been set up by Delta Force veterans, so it had more of that lineage. But, I mean, they did, you know, essentially a lot of the same thing, though Triple Canopy was never quite as prestigious, obviously. Now, they mentioned something called the uh, Constellus Group, um, which I hadn't heard of before. And was that connected to Triple Canopy as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, Constellus Group is owned um, by Leon Black's Apollo Capital, which is a major you know, hedge fund, something you know, to that effect. But um, Constellus, uh, it seems like it's become a major holding company, essentially, for private military firms. In addition to owning Triple Canopy now... It also owns um, whatever Blackwater happens to be calling itself now, Academia or XE or whatever the heck it is this week. Um, but yeah, I mean, now both of those companies are owned outright by Constellus, uh, like I said, which in turn is owned by the Apollo Group, which in turn is owned by Leon Black, who is a longtime associate of Donald Trump uh, and also the Kushner family. He gave them actually quite a couple, of, quite a few business loans recently. There's something called the Analysis Corporation, and this was a defense solution to look for counterterrorism or something along those lines. Was that, and that the close ties to intelligence and law enforcement, home, homeland security, and all of this? What what exactly was the Analysis Corporation? Yeah, Clapper and Brennan. Um, okay. Yeah, that was another major uh, private intelligence racket that's. Um Actually, I think it might have been a kind of, if I remember correctly now, um, kind of an in industry group, I guess, that brought together a lot of the different private intelligence groups and so on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was sort of the Democratic version of this. Of course, the Republicans were sort of the trailblazers in this field. But then uh, Brennan and Clapper really got in on the act after they had retired, respectively, from the different branches of the intelligence community that they were in. Is there anything else that's kind of an important subject in relation to all this that you kind of wanted to go over or discuss that you think would be beneficial for giving the listeners kind of an understanding of all this? Uh, well, I mean, of course, you know, the overriding theme of uh, the book was really trauma and how trauma was, you know, oriented into societies and so on. Um, we had kind of used Naomi Klein's concept of the shock doctrine as uh, a basis for the book to kind of work off of. Um, um, but yeah, uh, one of the most you know fascinating things that I really uncovered when I started researching these different topics uh, for the book was just really the degree to which counterinsurgency doctrine had been so ingrained into U.S. foreign policy, and it kind of seems like increasingly domestically as well. Um, of course, the really dominant thread of this was the the French concept of Lique Revolutionaire, which uh, had been developed by French military officers in the aftermath of the Indochina War. They were trying to analyze France's defeat and study the military tactics of Mao Zedong that had been so effectively applied there. And um, their essential conclusion was that uh, they needed to become more authoritarian and brutal than the communists themselves. <laughs> so, yeah, um, anyway, these methods were originally employed in Algeria at quite horrific ends, um, especially with the use of torture and that type of thing and just how, um, you know, they dealt with prisoners. I mean, of course, it was common to abduct suspected terrorists. Uh, they were horrendously tortured for 24 hours um, because it was felt that after that time they didn't have any more useful intelligence. And um, then they committed suicide, which consisted of being flown out uh, in a helicopter over the Mediterranean and cast into the sea. The thinking being that now their mangled bodies would wash up on shore and that would have um, just an added effect to the populace at large uh, when their loved ones saw their dead bodies or something to that effect. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just horrendous. The Algerian conflict was just brutal on so many levels. And sadly, this just whole method became so popular 
in the 1970s. Um, of course, a lot of the Italian neo-fascists adopted it uh, in the so-called strategy of tension, which was used to destabilize Italy throughout the 70s and really spread to a lot of the other stay-behind armies that we were discussing earlier throughout Western Europe um, during the Cold War era. Uh, it was an underlining ideology that was transferred to a lot of the regimes in the Southern Cone and Chile and Argentina and so forth. Because in many cases, I mean, the military officers in France who had designed this uh, this strategy were, you know, sent there to train, you know, the uh, the forces there firsthand. So, I mean, it was an underpinning ideology behind Condor and just all of the brutal, dirty wars that were waged in that region of the world throughout the latter stages of the Cold War. And then finally, um, for the United States, it, it was a major factor behind the Phoenix program. Uh, quite a few of the uh, you know, CIA and military officers, or specifically the Green Berets, uh, they had actually been trained firsthand by some of the like, revolutionary strategists, and uh, several of the CIA officers who had overseen Phoenix were quite influenced by this doctrine as well. So, I mean, it just had an enormous influence in counterinsurgency doctrines really across the globe in the 1960s. And um, sadly, it went into a major revival during the War on Terror. Um, certainly, David Petraeus had cited uh, several of the the, the gay revolutionary theorists uh, as major inspirations behind our most recent counterinsurgency doctrine that's been used in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, you know, this really has disturbing implications um, because there are indications that, you know, this is coming home. Of course, counterinsurgency is really the major dominion of the Special Operations, or the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. It's what, you know, the Delta Force is about. It's what uh, SEAL Team 6 is about. Um, and increasingly, as you see these guys going into private military companies, there's an increasing, you know, threat that this is going to be brought home and I think to some extent we're seeing it with um, you know the Dakota Access Pipeline protesters. I mean you had Delta Force veterans, a private military firm that had been set up by Delta Force veterans being used against these guys. So this is bringing just this horrendous counterinsurgency doctrine back to the American public. Um, it's really the ultimate form of blowback and um, it's very disturbing for what it, you know, really potentially holds for the future of the country. This is uh, kind of just off topic since we're kind of getting towards the end here. Uh, I think, it, you know, a lot of people, they want to really, really badly to believe that Trump is doing good behind the scenes. And I, I just don't know. Um, personally, one of the things I love about you is that you keep it real in that sense. Um, and you're very informed about Trump and his dealings and all that. So what what are some of the most compelling notes on Trump that that people could be more aware of in terms of his corruption and just in general that this kind of leads one to be distrustful of his intentions? Well, I mean, the first thing you got to look at is the fact that, you know, he was the CEO of this, you know, this company we were just talking about, Resorts International. I mean, like I said before, I mean, this was a company, you know, the great Peter Dale Scott uncovered the Office of Security Files from the CIA that, you know, proved that the CIA had used it at various points for operations. Uh, so, I mean, it was very much a CIA-linked firm. It has its own private intelligence company in Intertel, and it's mobbed up to the freaking gills. And, you know, Trump was the CEO of this company. He wouldn't even have gotten to that po to that post if he wasn't an insider. And, um, you know, Resort still seems like it's, uh, and some of the people that he met there, I mean, they're still, or at least their descendants are still part of his entourage. I mean, one of the guys was um, Resort's attorney in Atlantic City. Resort's was actually, by the way, the company that really led to gambling being legalized in Atlantic City, which is where Trump really made his fortune off of. And one of Resort's attorneys that was crucial to this was a guy named Patrick McGon. Um, and Trump also used this guy as his casino attorney in Atlantic City for many years, um, till I think the mid-90s when Trump sued him for overbilling him or something to that effect. But um, it apparently, uh, the lawsuit did not uh, dissuade uh, Patrick's cousin, um, gosh, what was his name, Donald or Greg or something to that effect. Um, let me see here. Oh, shoot, I'm not finding it. Oh, Don, Don McGon. okay. This guy was the White House uh, counsel 
uh, from 2017 to 2018, and he was also the guy who really uh, put forth a lot of the Supreme Court judges that uh, Trump nominated, Calvin All and the other guy, uh, Neil Gorsuch or whatever the heck his name was. But you know, this is the guy who's really played a huge role in shaping the Supreme Court nominations and some of the lesser court appointments that Trump has made. And I mean, his whole family is tied up with Resorts International, this, you know, mob CIA unholy alliance, you know. So Trump has got all these ties to Resorts International. And then when you start looking at the people who were really crucial to bringing him to power, you're just seeing all of these, you know, JSOC guys or people affiliated with it. Eric Prince, General Keith Kellogg, who had overseen parts of um, the Special Operations Forces in Europe, uh, who had been at Green Beret during Vietnam. Um, you know, this is really the forces that put Trump in power. And uh, especially, you know, with Eric Prince, I mean, Prince just ties into so just really a, you know, cabal a private intelligence that appears to be behind both Trump and Brexit. I mean, of course, in this sense, I'm referring to the SCL group in Cambridge Analytica, um, the firm that was really used uh, to manipulate social media and so on and so forth for both the benefit of Trump and Brexit. But I mean, these you know firms, I mean, they're tied into Frontier Services, uh, Eric Prince's mercenary firm. They're tied into Plantier, Peter Thiel's um, you know, cyber security outfit. They're tied into the Flint group, which is the private intelligence service of Michael Flynn, Trump's former national security advisor, another JSOC veteran, another guy that was crucial in his rise to power. So, I mean, you can even just see the outlines of this, you know, cabal, which is largely comprised of uh, cybersecurity firms, private intelligence uh, firms, and private military companies, and uh, of course, the ties to the Joint Special Operations Executive. I mean, Trump is most assuredly an insider. Um, you know, this is all just, to my mind, part of an ongoing civil war, uh, and really just a part of the reorientation of America's security services that happened under Bush II and Donald Rumsfeld. I mean, you really saw the rise of a lot of these special operators. I mean, there's been romanticism about them for years with the Rambo movies and all this other stuff, but they were nothing, really, before the Bush II years. And now, I mean, these guys are in charge of multi-million, in some cases, probably multi-billion dollar corporations. Um, they've been, you know, used to destabilize regimes across the world for decades, or not decades, but years now. I mean, just look at what JSOC has done in Yemen and Somalia. And, um, you know, certainly it seems like they are, they have more than adequate resources to do the same in the UK and the US now. So, um, yeah, you know, there's definitely a lot of very sinister and shady things behind Trump. And I think you've got to be blind to not see it, uh, you know, if you look hard enough. Definitely. So are you suggesting that we should not trust the Q plan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would probably be a fair <laughs> assessment. What do you think this whole Q phenomenon thing is about? Do you have any insight into any of that? I mean, I believe Q is a real guy or a real intel thing, but the intentions of it, I'm not really too sure. Yeah, about. no, I mean, it's definitely, I would say, a major disinformation front uh, and is trying to, you know, perpetuate this whole image of Trump being an outsider, um, you know, which is just ridiculous. Um, but yeah, you know, you're really seeing things, especially with the COVID-19 thing going into overdrive. Um, it's, it's really quite just incredible to see all this playing out. But, um, you know, you're seeing, I just think a lot of conspiracy types being triggered by the things with bill gates and this you know threat of the vaccine with the chip in it and um elsewhere you know i mean trump is throwing the gauntlet down against the world health organization and by default the un i mean he's essentially really ramping up tensions with china i mean i think today they just announced that there was a full-blown intelligence probe into the wuhan uh bioweapons you know thing that they've got there so yeah you know it's really disturbing because COVID, if nothing else, has really put the country on war footing, uh, and war footing specifically not for you know, uh, you know, something like Iraq, but a first world military like China's. And uh, at the same token, it's greatly ratcheting up the tension with that country as well. So, yeah, um, it does seem like there is quite an elaborate sleight of hand going on right now. Yeah. And you do you cover a lot of stuff with British intelligence and MI6 and all that. Do you find any connection between Trump, his administration, and British intelligence at all? 
Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of this, you know, goes back to what I kind of think of as the uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert old boys or the Drexel Burnham Lambert mafia. Uh, these were, you know, uh, Michael Milken worked for these guys in the 1980s. Of course, the famous junk bond king. Um, Milken was a close friend of Trump. Uh, he had helped him in the casino industry, which was a specialty of Milken's. Um, but another uh, guy that Milken was close to, who was one of his just favorite corporate raiders was a guy named Sir James Goldsmith. Good old Sir Jimmy. Uh, this guy was another financier for Brian Crozer, the guy I was talking about before, who was tied up with Frank Barnett and all these other guys. He knew Rupert Murdoch. Uh, he was very close to a lot of people involved with the Le Soquel complex and all that good stuff. Um, but more than anything, Sir Jimmy was really the guy who set up Brexit. Uh, he was a major financier of the UK independent party back in the 90s and i mean he really made euro skepticism a big thing in the uk he died in 96 but i mean to this day a lot of people tied to sir jimmy were still major financiers of brexit uh, one would be robin burley who was his son-in-law for instance so a lot of his old uh, business associates and what have you to this day are major backers of brexit and um sir jimmy was tied in with this whole you know click uh, that included trump Michael Milken, Leon Black, another guy who was part of Drexel Burnham we just talked about, and of course Trump's infamous attorney and political mentor Roy Cohn, and inevitably also Jeffrey Epstein. So you know there was a lot of shady stuff going on uh, in that you know particular circles in the 1980s. Yeah, definitely. Well, Stephen, your book is fascinating. It's deep, very detail oriented, and what well, you cover a lot. It's I, just a side note, um, it's really interesting, Rogan, Joe Rogan's actually starting to kind of get into some of this. He recently interviewed Tom O'Neill, I don't know if you're aware, aware. he did the, a book called Chaos covering MK Ultra. Oh yeah, 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 the Manson family, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's pretty, pretty exciting to kind of, you know, get that exposure out there, and I think this podcast will be very interesting for people to go deeper into these various you know, black operations and different intelligence connections and stuff. So, um, is there anything, any note you want to leave the audience on? Today? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, obviously, you know, you can get the book, The Strange Tales of the Parapolitical on Amazon if you're so inclined for a physical copy. Uh, if you head over to my website, which is visupview, V-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-W, it's all one word, dot blogspot, dot com. You can find links there to get the digital version, Currently, we're doing a, uh, what was it, a pandemic bundle or something. It's going to be my book, uh, along with uh, the book my co-author, Frank Zero, wrote with Jeremy Knight called Contact Them or Us. Uh, we've got a special deal for these two books, which is a little cheaper than one ver copy of the physical version of my book alone. So you might want to consider that. Um, and then, of course, um, if you aren't sick of listening to me by now, you can hear me on the Farm Podcast, uh, usually on a weekly basis. That's the Farm Podcast, uh, w excuse me, www.thefarmpodcast.com. And uh, we're also on YouTube under Zero Night The Farm as well. So, you know, definitely check us out. But, um, you know, thanks again so much for having me back on, Sky. It's been great. Definitely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good one. We are entering into uncharted territory. We are in apocalyptic COVID times. If you're a lady or a gent that is into health, wellness, self-improvement, maximizing your potential, and or just getting your shit together in general, if you're into that kind of thing, check out on it. Get your immune system up to par. Get your gut microbiome in check. Get your neurochem a boost in cognitive functionality. Get on it. O-N-N-I-T dot com. Enter code Philosophical Minds at checkout and save yourself up to 10% off any and all supplements.